The Federal Judicial Center presents Supreme Court 1997-98, The Term and Review, an FJTN program for judges, staff attorneys, and law clerks. Now from the television studios of the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C., your moderator, Russell Wheeler. Hello and welcome. Uh, this is the second part of the Federal Judicial Center's review of the Supreme Court's 1997 term. We're dealing with 52 of the over 90 decisions this term. The cases and biographies of our faculty are in your written materials. Criminal law and procedure is a staple on the court's docket. We'll discuss these cases for the next 30 minutes. First, we'll take up seven cases involving elements of the offense, search and seizure, and grand jury selection. Joining us to discuss them are Susan Herman of Brooklyn Law School, Evan Sun Lee of the University of California, Hastings College of the Law, and Tracy Macklin of Boston University School of Law. <clears throat> Tracy, let's start with these cases involving elements of the offense and go to the case of Brian v. U.S. Here, the, 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 the word of analysis was willfully. Right. And Brian, the defendant, was convicted of willfully violating the federal firearm statute. And the question was whether it, the, the prosecution had to show knowledge of that firearm statute, the defendant had knowledge of that, or simply knowledge that his actions were illegal. And the court ruled that he only had to have knowledge that his actions were illegal. And the court said, in that situation, we're going to go back to our traditional view of mens rea. Now, uh, in, in recent years, Tracy, the Supreme Court has had occasion to uh, deal with the mens rea provisions of several federal criminal statutes. In this case, did the court take a similar approach? No, they didn't. In those cases that you refer to, most of those cases involve either criminal tax cases or currency restructuring cases, the court took a very narrow view of what the mens rea requirement was, which helped defendants. In this case, the court went back to the traditional view of mens rea and said that simply that the individual had knowledge that what he was doing was illegal. He did not have to have the additional knowledge that he was violating the federal licensing statute. I thought it was noteworthy that the thing that seemed to really split the majority and the dissenters here, Justice Scalia, Chief Justice Rehnquist, and Justice Ginsburg, was the rule of lenity. The, the three of them thought that this was really an appropriate case for applying the rule of lenity. And it seems as if there's a real split among the justices about how f often to apply the rule of lenity. That um, explains the difference of opinion both in Brian and in our next case as well. The Muscarello case. Right, Muscarello. Why don't you just pick up that point? Well, sure. Well, uh, Muscarello involved an interpretation of the very frequently charged statute 924C1, mm -hmm. under which a defendant uh, has, gets a five-year mandatory minimum if they're found to have used or carried a firearm during and in relation to a drug offense, many elements. So, of course, several years ago, the court in the Bailey case had very narrowly construed the term use, and the question in Muscarello was whether they would apply a similar narrow construction to the term carry, holding that it would only apply if the firearm was readily accessible during the drug transaction. Well, the court didn't do that, of course. They decided to choose the more expansive view of the word carry so that a person can be convicted under 924C1 if they had a gun in the glove compartment or the trunk of a car that they have actually mm -hmm. driven to the drug transaction. Now, I, what I actually thought was interesting, this is a 5-4 decision, and I think that what the justices talk about in their opinions is an interesting window onto the kinds of debates the court has been having about statutory interpretation lately. So I think it's worth saying a word about sure. how they get there. Um, with a dictionary. With, with the dictionary, exactly. <laughs> well, Carrie has 32 definitions in the dictionary, and the court talks about two in talking about what's the ordinary meaning of the word carry. They also talked about, this is, I think, the kind of a fun part of the opinion, they talk about how the word carry is used in the Bible, how it's used in the New York Times, how it's used by authors like Herman Melville. Um, you know, sort of, that's their Justice ordinary... Justice Breyer did a little content analysis of newspapers. To the content, yeah, he yeah. shows how broadly he reads. He reads many different kinds of things. So that was the first part of the opinion. The second part, they focus more on Congress, talking about a little bit of legislative history, what Congress would have meant in congressional purpose, and conclude that what this statute was for was to encourage drug dealers to leave their guns at home, which they thought argued for a broader interpretation of carry. And third was comparing the use of the word carry here to usages of that word and the word transport, the rival word, in other statutes other than this. But again, what I found actually the most interesting, what I thought really split the court, the, in, in Muscarello it was four justices who dissent, believing that the rule of lenity should have applied here. Justice Breyer says, no, you only apply the rule of lenity where there's a grievous ambiguity and where the court would just be guessing what the statute meant. Now, I think it may be too early to tell whether this is something decisive going on and how to use the rule of lenity in interpreting statutes, 
but maybe not. And one thing I actually thought was interesting, too, about Muscarello was that the opinion reads very differently from the Bailey opinion. Tracy, what did you think well, of this? Well, in, in, that's true, because in Bailey, uh, the court took a very narrow view of the term use. In the defendant in Mescarello said, well, you should take that same narrow approach in terms of defining the word carry. And the court said no, because to do so would undercut the purpose of the statute. And with respect to the concern that this was not going to be used or that the people would be prosecuted where guns weren't involved, the court said that the statute's limiting phrase during and in relation to a drug crime uh, would prevent prosecutions that were involved or prevent f cases where people had not used guns. So the court took a very different approach than they took in Bailey. So what's going to be the impact of Muscarello? That's the question. Well, I think part of the impact is that it certainly limits the um, breadth of the Bailey decision because what the government can do in the future is any place where formerly they would have charged somebody with using an offense, they can charge carry, which is a much broader term. Although I should note it's not completely subsuming use because there was a case a few years ago where the court in the Smith case held that you can use a gun in a drug transaction without carrying it by bartering it, by bartering mm -hmm. the gun in exchange for drugs. So I think what we're going to see in the future after Muscarello is why wouldn't the government charge everybody, indict everybody with carrying rather than using yeah. it? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think for the future what it means is that federal district courts are going to be dealing with Bailey versus the United States almost exclusively in the habeas context rather yeah. than uh, direct appeals. And in fact, that was uh, what happened in the Bowsley case, Bowsley versus the United States, which we'll be covering in part three. Um, but for now, I think it suffices to say that the court's decision in Muscarello effectively liberates the federal habeas courts from having to deal with the Bailey slash Bowsley situation in the Kerry context uh, uh, by defining the Kerry element broadly rather than narrowly. I'm not suggesting that that's why they did it, but that has an no, effect. No, I understand. <clears throat> and as you say, we'll get to the Bowsley case right. when, we, when we discuss the habeas right. uh, cases this term. Uh, on the elements of the offense, though, uh, let's go to the Salinas case. This uh, was a, a conviction of a Texas correctional officer under both a bribery statute and a uh, RICO uh, uh, prosecution. And, and it was a, a, an institution that was taking federal grant money. That gave That's rise right. to the bribery statute. The important holding here, I think, Russell, is the RICO conspiracy. It resolves a conflict in the circuits and in so doing changes the law in the First Circuit, the Second Circuit, and the Tenth Circuit. Uh, the court uh, held here that the government need not prove that a defendant committed or even agreed to commit more than one predicate offense to make out a RICO conspiracy violation, which is significant because, as we all know, for a substantive RICO violation, the government does have to prove more than one predicate offense. All the government has to prove to make out the conspiracy is uh, that the defendant adopted the goal of furthering more than one predicate offense. And that can be done in many ways other than by physically committing it. Then in a separate holding, the court held that uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 666, which is the bribery right. statute, does not require any proof of an effect on federal funds. Of course, there has to be a nexus between the bribery and some organization that is receiving federal funding. But there doesn't have to be any proof of damage or harm to the federal fisc. The money the officer got did not come from the federal grant. It came from other places. That's right. Thanks, Evan. The uh, court discussed the elements of the offense in several other cases this term. Uh, one of them, United States v. Cabrales, is also in your materials. Cabrales involved a circuit split over the proper venue for prosecutions under the money laundering statutes. The court said that Florida, not Missouri, was the proper venue for a prosecution when Cabrales laundered the money in Florida but was not involved in the Missouri drug deal that generated the money and didn't bring the money to Florida. <clears throat> Susan, every term has its uh, Fourth Amendment cases. Uh, this term, one of them was um, the Pennsylvania case, P Pennsylvania Board of Probation versus Scott. Could you describe that case for us? Sure, you're right. Every term has its Fourth Amendment cases, but this term actually only had two decided, right. which I think is part of a recent trend where the court has been spending more of its time analyzing federal criminal statutes than deciding criminal procedure cases that would apply to the states. That's an interesting and, point. Well, Scott is no exception, because what it does is it frees the state, uh, states up to set their own procedural rules. In a 5-4 opinion by Justice Thomas, the court held that the federal exclusionary rule does not apply in parole revocation proceedings, even if the parolee's Fourth Amendment rights were violated by the search and seizure of evidence. And in some ways, this opinion wasn't very surprising, because it followed on previous cases where the court has tried to decide on applicability of the federal exclusionary rule. 
using a cost-benefit analysis in mm -hmm. which the court you know, weighs the costs, mm -hmm. said here to be that parolees go free, and also that what might otherwise be a somewhat informal parole revocation proceeding would be made more formal mm -hmm. by applying such rules, um, against the benefits which the court, the majority describes as the incremental deterrence that you would get by having an agent who's doing the search know that evidence might not be usable at a parole revocation proceeding. Mm -hmm. And on balance, they hold the rule doesn't apply. Now, what the dissenters said, I thought this was interesting, was they thought that there was um, really no deterrence at all if the person doing the search knows that there's a parolee involved, because if you know you're going to be able to use the evidence, why not mm -hmm. use the search? Which I think is not strictly true, because it might be that they would still be interested in using the evidence in an actual criminal prosecution of the parolee in addition to the revocation proceeding. So there the Fourth Amendment might, right, might still matter, right, Tracy? And that's one yeah. of the questions that the court left open in Scott, mm -hmm. because uh, drug agents, the FBI often work hand in glove with uh, parole agents, and the court did not decide in Scott whether, one, a suspicionless search of a parolee would be constitutional, and then second, whether or not a parolee can waive his or her constitutional rights as a condition of parole. The court and Scott, those issues were brief for the court, but the court didn't decide those cases. Maybe we'll see them later. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, there was, uh, Evan, this term also a no-knock case, like, like last okay. term. This term's case was U.S. v. Ramirez. Yes. What was the holding there? Uh, the court held that the validity of a no-knock entry has nothing to do with whether property is destroyed. As you recall, last term uh, in Richards versus Wisconsin, mm -hmm. the court held that uh, the validity of a no-knock entry uh, or, or a no-knock entry is valid if the uh, police have reasonable suspicion to believe that it would that announcing would be dangerous or would be futile, would uh, inhibit the effectiveness of the investigation. What the Ninth Circuit had held in Ramirez was that there is an even higher standard that the police have to meet, that they have to give an even more compelling reason if they destroy property. But the Supreme Court rejected that heightened uh, standard. Now, the court noted that uh, the unreasonable destruction of property by the police might still be actionable uh, civilly under, under Bivens, but that the remedy for that would not be the suppression of uh, evidence in a criminal proceeding. There was also a holding in this case regarding uh, Section 3109, mm -hmm. in which the, the court said uh, that uh, 3109 codifies the common law exception to the knock and announce requirement also made it clear that uh, the Fourth Amendment precedents like Richards, like Wilson, also govern the interpretation of Section 3109. Thanks, Evan. Thanks for that. Uh, uh, Susan and Tracy, real quick, can we uh, uh, say anything about what's on the horizon? Any, any Fourth Amendment cases coming down the, sure. the pike? Two cert grants. One concerns the um, scope of application of the search incident to arrest doctrine. There's an Iowa statute that authorizes officers who do traffic stops and decide not to arrest somebody, but instead to give them a traffic citation. Mm -hmm. The statute authorizes them to do a search incident to arrest nevertheless. That's Knowles? Knowles versus Iowa. Uh -huh. The second case, Russell, is a case called Minnesota versus Carter, and there are two questions there. One, whether in guests or invitees have standing to raise a Fourth Amendment claim when they're in someone else's home. And then second, whether an officer's non-enhanced use of visual surveillance into the home, does that constitute a search under the meaning of the Fourth Amendment? Okay, we'll watch for those. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks, uh, Susan. Evan, uh, getting back to this term, uh, we had another decision in the Batson line. This involved grand juries. This is the case of Campbell v. Louisiana. Yes, in which the court held that a white criminal defendant has standing to challenge uh, discrimination against blacks in the composition of a grand jury. Right. You recall that in Powers versus Ohio, the court mm -hmm. held that even a white criminal defendant has standing to challenge uh, racial discrimination in the composition of a pettit jury. This case extends that to grand juries. Mm -hmm. um, now, it is true that this case involves, happened to involve a grand jury for person, but that's not really integral to the holding here. What's important is that this case applies to any state procedure where uh, the selection of a grand jury for person is also effectively the selection of a grand jury member. It applies to the composition of grand juries generally. So it doesn't apply in the federal circumstance yeah. in no. which the judge picks the four person from among the, jur the grand jurors already no. selected? No. Uh, okay, thanks, Evan, and thanks, Susan, and thanks, Tracy. In just a moment, we'll take up 11 more criminal law and procedure cases. Cases under the Self-Incrimination Clause. 
about the attorney-client privilege, the right to confrontation, double jeopardy, sentencing. Joining Tracy Macklin to discuss these cases is Lori Levinson of Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. <coughs> Lori, um, circuits have differed on the so-called exculpatory no. And uh, we now have the Brogan case, and it says no to exculpatory no. That's absolutely right. The exculpatory no defense is out the window. What the court held was that the exculpatory no doctrine, which used to say that if all the defendant did was deny the underlying criminal conduct, that's not a violation of 1001. The court said, yes, it is. The statute says that any false statement mm -hmm. is covered. And it doesn't matter whether it impedes the investigation or not. You have no Fifth Amendment right to lie. The court, I think, reached this result because it looked at DOJ policies and said there has not been abuse by prosecutors. They don't usually bring these charges. So, in fact, there will be no exculpatory no doctrine. We had Justice Ginsburg telling Congress how it could fix that. That's right. The concurrence said, wait a second, we are concerned that there could be some abuses. We think it would be a good idea for Congress to put into the statute that actual defense. Let me talk about that just a little later also. Thanks, Lori. Tracy. Same thing in the civil context. It came out of a Merit Systems Protection Board right. investigation. This is Lachance v. Erickson. Right. This involved a case in which involved some employee misconduct on the job, and the question was, could you punish someone for making a false statement to an investigator? And the Supreme Court looked at both the statute as well as the due process clause and said, yes, you could punish someone uh, in this situation. Under the statutory analysis, the Chief Justice said there's simply no right in the statute to lie. With respect to the due process clause, the Chief Justice assumed that these employees had a property right uh, in their jobs and said, well, certainly that entitles you to notice in a hearing, but that does not entitle you to lie to investigators who are asking you questions about misconduct. With respect to the Court of Appeals concern that this might coerce uh, employees to make statements to uh, investigators, the Chief said, look, the Chief Justice said, look, if you're concerned about that, rely on your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. There's simply no right to lie. I think the moral of the story is if you're in trouble, keep your mouth shut. I think that's right. With Brogan also, you have no Fifth Amendment right to lie, and it doesn't matter whether it impedes any investigation. Okay, thanks. Thanks to you both. Lori, uh, one other uh, self-incrimination case, different context. This is the Balsas case, and a defendant who uh, wanted to assert the right because he was afraid to get prosecuted in a foreign country in one of the Balkans. Yeah, well, the case is a very long decision, but what it boils down to is if all the defendant fears is prosecution by a foreign authority, that does not trigger the Fifth Amendment. If, however, he fears prosecution by either a state or federal domestic authority, that does trigger the, the protection. And uh, we have this uh, reference by Justice Souter that in the majority opinion that the day could come, I think he says, when uh, uh, people may be able to invoke the, the self-incrimination clause in circumstances like this. When's that day going to come? Well, I don't think it's real soon. I mean, the dissent thinks that the day is here now, but certainly it takes more than just international cooperation. What Justice Souter suggests is if there's collaboration between the United States authorities and foreign authorities, the same statutes, an overlapping investigation, then maybe you have the Fifth Amendment privilege. But I don't see that readily on the horizon. <clears throat> Thanks. Let's, let's turn to this case of Swidler in Berlin. It's the name of a law firm. It grew out of a, a case the court took on an expedited schedule. It heard argument in June. It decided it in June at the request of the independent uh, counsel in the Whitewater investigation. Uh, about attorney-client privilege and the Vincent Foster suicide. Right. I think this came at, case came out exactly as people expected. What Justice Rehnquist said, Chief Justice, was, look, the privilege survives the client's death. Ken Starr's people were looking for a balancing test, saying that if you really need the information, you can get it. And the court said no, that this would affect the attorney-client relationship, and Starr's people had not met their burden. Now, the Chief Justice did not dismiss, though, the argument the, the Vindman Council put forward. He just, he, I think the words were, uh, we have a thoughtful speculation when empirical information would be useful. That's right. The Chief Justice made a big point of saying it wasn't a frivolous argument, but ironically, the National Law Journal, the same week as the opinion came out with that empirical evidence, and most lawyers in this country think that the privilege should remain the way it is. Reported the results of a survey of the bar. Right. Thanks, Lori. Tracy, the Bruton rule is back with us. It came back in the case of Gray versus Maryland. Right. Tell us about that case. Well, Bruton limits the ability of a prosecutor to use a non-testifying co-defendant's confession that implicates a defendant in a joint trial. And what Bruton requires is the prosecution is going to use such a confession, it's got to redact that confession. The question in Gray was where we have a 
confession that is redacted either by leaving a blank space or the word deleted mm -hmm. in place of the defendant's name, is that permissible under the Constitution? And the court, by a five to four ruling uh, opinion written by Justice Breyer, said that that does not pass constitutional muster in this particular case. Well, why didn't this uh, redaction satisfy Richardson versus Marsh? Good question. In Marsh, the court upheld a redacted confession or the use of a redacted confession in which all reference to the defendant's name and uh, even existence was eliminated. And what Justice Breyer did in Gray was say, well, we understand that certain times uh, incrimination um, by inference is going to occur. It occurred in Marsh where the defendant herself took the stand. The question is the type or kind of incrimination that is going to occur in this case. And so Justice Breyer said, we find in this case, particularly where you have the word deleted or a blank space, that almost involves a facial incrimination. Mm -hmm. So we do not have a situation here where we've got a lot of bright lines uh, uh, given by the court. No bright lines. Anything about cautionary instructions? Always, always the district judges have to give a cautionary instruction, whether you have the Marsh situation or the situation that arose in Bruton or now the situation that we have in Gray. Okay, thanks, Tracy. Uh, let's turn to double jeopardy, Laurie. Uh, we had the case from Oklahoma. A couple of uh, this is Hudson v. U.S. and some Oklahoma bankers who were penalized by the Office of the Controller of the Currency for uh, some loans, I think. A couple of years later, they were indicted for basically the same conduct. And Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote the opinion in this case. And what the court held is that they're backing off from the Halper decision. Mm -hmm. That in terms of a civil statute triggering double jeopardy, it's no longer you look at its effect. You have to go back to the statute and see really whether on its face it has a criminal-like punishment. And it's going to be very unlikely it does. You have to show the clearest of proof. In this situation, the floodgates had opened after mm -hmm. Halper. A lot of people were claiming that disbarment proceedings and other types of civil penalties were triggering double jeopardy. The court wanted to stop that and has done so by saying, go back to the Wade standard, look at the statute on its face. <coughs> and those, those were not uh, mild penalties that the OCC imposed, though. No, these are very severe penalties, but it doesn't really matter. You know, have to look at the really purpose of the statute. And even if the purpose is to deter conduct, that alone does not make it a criminal type of statute. Thanks. Uh, federal double jeopardy. Uh, there's a state from a case from California also. This is the Monge case, right. Tracy. This involved the California three strikes and you're outlaw in a prior uh, prior offense. Right. In this case, the defendant, Mr. Monge, faced a possible doubling of his sentencing if the prosecution could prove that he committed a previous serious felony all agreed, prosecution and defense, that there was insufficient evidence to prove that at the sentencing hearing. The question was, was does the double jeopardy clause apply at sentencing? And the Supreme Court, speaking through Justice O'Connor, said no, it didn't. I think the court gave two reasons. First, the court ruled that as a historical matter, the double jeopardy clause doesn't apply at sentencing because the defendant is not in jeopardy within the meaning of the clause. And then second, the court found, as a traditional matter, sentencing enhancement does not involve uh, uh, punishment for a previous offense. Mm -hmm. The second reason the court gave uh, concerned a case called Bullington versus Missouri, which was a 1981 case in which the court did apply the double jeopardy clause to sentencing. The difference, however, was that Justice O'Connor said Bullington involved capital, a capital case, and the court has very special rules about capital sentencing and what can and cannot occur. O'Connor made clear that Bullington is going to be limited to capital sentencing proceedings. And so we go back to the traditional rule mm -hmm. that double jeopardy, unless we deal with a capital case, does not apply in a non-capital sentencing proceeding. Okay, thanks to you both for the double jeopardy discussion. Tracy, federal sentencing law got its attention this term. Uh, this matter of, of uh, uh, a punishment, varying punishment for crack cocaine and cocaine has bedeviled federal criminal justice policy throughout the decade. We had the Edwards case where that issue arose. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that case. Edwards involved a case uh, where there was a conspiracy to distribute a controlled substance. The jury came back with a guilty verdict, except for their verdict was a general verdict. They didn't determine or didn't decide whether crack cocaine or powdered cocaine was involved. The judge gave a higher sentence based on the crack cocaine uh, based on the crack cocaine on the, on the sentencing guidelines. The defendant objected to that. The Seventh Circuit affirmed. The Supreme Court affirmed the Seventh Circuit. And the Supreme Court said two things. They said, first of all, under the sentencing guidelines, the judge is required to find, for sentencing purposes, whether crack or cocaine or both were involved. Mm -hmm. So that was the first point. And then second, the court said, with respect to the defendant's argument that the judge should assume that 
uh, powder cocaine was involved, because that, of course, would involve a lesser sentence. The court said, no, the judge is supposed to determine both the type and amount of cocaine involved, as well as the relevant conduct mm -hmm. involved in this situation. And so there, the court said, what the judge did here was perfectly legal under the guidelines. Okay, thanks. Another sentencing case, uh, this whole business of um, uh, uh, recidivist elements in statutes, are they, are they new crimes or are they enhancements? We have the Almondores case of, uh, involved in immigration uh, deportation. Right. In this case, Almondores Torres, what right. the court took a look at is a statute that says if an alien re uh, returns after being deported, it's usually a two-year penalty. Mm -hmm. However, if they return after being convicted of an aggravated felony, right. it's all of a sudden 20 years. Right. And the question is, does the prosecution have to allege that in the indictment and prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? The court said no. This is just a penalty enhancement. And in making that decision, in a 5-4 to four decision, the court took a look at the language of the statute, mm -hmm. its history, but most of all, that this involved recidivism. And when you have recidivism, the court is much more likely to say, this doesn't require a separate proof. We're going to see more of these, these kinds of sentencing provisions, you think? I think you'll see more of these provisions more likely to be upheld. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, however, is that there's a suggestion in the opinion that even at the sentencing proceeding, you might need a higher level of proof to show that aggravating factor. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, uh, much less attention uh, in, uh, to the provision in our next case. This is the excessive fine clause in the Eighth Amendment. And this is a pretty important case, uh, U.S. v. Bajikajan. Here we had a, a rather strange lineup, but uh, in a five to four case, what was the decision? Well, I think this case is one of the most important decisions of the term, mainly because it's going to create a lot of work for our district court judges. Mm -hmm. For the first time, the Supreme Court has said that a forfeiture violated the excessive fine provision. And now the courts have to figure out when do other forfeitures do so. You can take a look at the facts of this case. You had an individual who failed to report over $350,000 he was leaving with. What happened is that the government wanted to forfeit all of it. The district court said, judge said, no, only $15,000 of it. And the Supreme Court upheld the district court judge. In doing so, basically, they tried to give some standards, but they're not much of standards. Mm -hmm. First, you look at legislation and say and give difference to that. But in fact, the court didn't do it. But then the court set out some factors that, in fact, d district court judges can look at, primarily was this just a reporting violation, or was it tied to some other type of illegal violation? You also look at the sentencing violation, sentencing guidelines, and then finally you look at if there was any harm really caused. But we can expect there are going to be many more allegations of the violation of the excessive fine clause. <coughs> the majority of the minority uh, disagreed uh, quite strongly on what kind of defendant we had here, as a matter of fact. Right. Uh, the dissent, in fact, says that the drug lords are going to be thrilled by this decision. And you had somebody here who did know what was going on, in fact, gave contradictory statements. In fact, ironically, going back to our Brogan case, right. you probably could have charged this person with a violation of 1001. But coming out of this case, the court has set up this grossly disproportionate standard. What the dissent warns is that Congress might come back and say, forget the forfeitures. Let's throw all of these people in jail. Some more prosecutions. Well, we'll watch that case. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Lori. Uh, Tracy, we had a, a capital sentencing case that came up on habeas. We want to talk about this is Buchanan v. Yeah. Angelone. And uh, federal judges operate under fairly strict guidance as to, as to mitigating circumstances in the jury instructions in these cases. It wasn't quite so clear in the Virginia case. How did the court come out? Well, what happened here was that the defendant requested that the jury be instructed in a death penalty case, right. that the jury be instructed on the concept of mitigation as well as on the specific statutory factors of mitigation under Virginia law. The trial judge denied that instruction. The question was, did that refusal to instruct on those two points violate the Eighth Amendment? The Chief Justice, Chief Justice Rehnquist, ruled that it did not violate the Eighth Amendment under the appropriate test, which was articulated in a case called Boyd versus California. The question the judges have to ask themselves is whether there was a reasonable likelihood that the jury would not consider the mitigating evidence that was offered. Applying that test here, the Chief Justice says there's no way that the Boyd standard would have been violated here because, one, there were several days of testimony. Mm -hmm. Both the prosecution as well as the defense counsel told the jury that they should consider all this evidence in making their determination of whether the execute the defendant or not. And most importantly, the trial judge had instructed the jury to consider all of the evidence in the case. So based on that instruction, as well as the other factors in the case, the Chief 
the Chief Justice found that the Boyd standard had not been violated here. He made it a point, however, to make clear that this was not the situation that we have in Texas. Of course, the judges know that Texas has a special instructions, and the Supreme Court has a whole jurisprudence dealing with the Texas death penalty. The court said here, unlike the Texas death penalty situation here, there was nothing to constrain the jury in the manner of considering the mitigating evidence that was offered here. Uh, that concludes the second part of the review of the Supreme Court's 1997 term. In the third and final part of our program, we'll look at the court's continuing interpretation of the 1996 Habeas Reform Act and other habeas issues, and then we'll take up some cases involving jurisdiction and standing, scientific evidence, and bankruptcy. I hope you can join us and that you will remember to complete the evaluation forms for this program. And good day.